Okay, guys, let's start again. Um, again, I apologize for the lack of organization in the course. What I'm going to do is just go through and teach what I know needs to be taught. And then I'm going to go back and watch the videos and figure out what all I said, what needs to go where. So we'll all be organized by learning module, but it'll be after the class is over, not before. So that'll be tonight's work, is organizing all this stuff that I've done today. I'm trying to attack this in a way that you can learn and understand why all the little pieces that I'm going to show you are important. Uh, it can be difficult because there's so many different things here. There's not just programming, there's interfacing, there's module types, there's signal levels, there's power levels. There's so many different things to think about when it comes to PLCs. And they're all related to each other. It's, it's one of the things I struggled with when I started thinking about this course and I was looking at how Lucas did it. It's like, where's the entry point? What's the door you go through to begin to understand all of this? And I think the door to go through is sort of a historical perspective of how things have been done in the past. I've just set a PLC uh, next to you, and I want to, let's see, how do I want to go through this? I want to show you what this PLC replaces and what it doesn't replace. There's a couple of things about relays that I want you to know, and that's really where I'm going with this, is, is to relays. Relay logic is what ha was used in the past to control machines. Okay? It's the way you program them. It's all kinds of things. And it, it's a fairly complicated, difficult thing to do. As a matter of fact, uh, well, I'll tell you that in a minute. I'll show you more what a relay is here in a moment. But I want to show you some videos to start off. Um, and I'm not going to show you the whole things. But I do want to show you a little bit. This one is a fairly low quality video as far as the resolution is concerned. I'm not going to bother. You can watch this. Well, you know, it's only two minutes. I'll just show it to you. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. It's not Harry Potter. His name is Harry Potter. And let me turn it on and I'll restart it. I check my code here and I see what that particular byte should be. Let me back up. Because he's talking a lot about the details of computers. Let me preface this quickly and tell you. He's made a computer out of relays. That's, that's actually the way that computers used to be made. The first computers that were what we know as computers today were made of relays. So you can use relays to make a computer. It's really slow, <laughs> but you can do it. Anyway, watch this video, then we'll talk about it. The program is entered in binary, byte by byte. So we start with putting the address in. And then I, I check my code here, and I see what that particular byte should be. And then I toggle it into memory, like that, and then move on to the next address. So these are the... I wish they had put much later as a title. <laughs> yeah. Registers here. There are eight eight bit registers. And this is the arithmetic logic unit right here. The ALU takes its inputs from the B and the C registers, and the output is fed back onto a data bus. There's an eight bit data bus running up and down, eight parallel wires essentially. And so for example, we can select a register like selecting the B register, and then you see down here that that value comes out on the bus. And then we can load it into a register, such as the X register here, and then unselect it. And over here, you have the program counter, the instruction register, and some other stuff. There's also a 16-bit bus for addresses. And then in this box here, you have the program control, and the sequencing, and instruction decoding, and also the memory unit. Basically what he's done there is made a really, really obsolete computer. Right? That's what it is. In fact, 
you could kind of count. Did you notice the rhythm? I noticed it comes through bopping your hands to it, right? Da, 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 da. It was about four clicks per second. Did you notice that? That means this computer is operating at four hertz, four cycles per second. You, the computer sitting in front of you operates at about two gigahertz, maybe three gigahertz. So four things per second versus, what's a giga? Is it a 10 to the ninth if I'm thinking right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so three gigahertz is three times 10 to the ninth things per second. Plus, he was dealing with an 8-bit machine. You're dealing with a 64-bit machine. Okay. What does bits mean? Well, for right now, I'll suffice it to say 8 bits versus 64. 8 times 8 is 64, if I'm thinking right, right? Yeah, 8 times 8 is 64. You're dealing with a machine that is basically, let's just call it 4 gigahertz. I know it's not really there, but just to make that math easy. You're dealing with a computer that is a, a billion times faster and 4 times as wide. No, 8 times as wide. That's what you have sitting in front of you. Okay. So why did I show you that? Well, that's actually the way things used to be done with computers. Those are the first, what we would know today as computers, those relay machines. And it's interesting that he designed that machine. Um, I wouldn't. I have other things to do with my time. But I'm sure he learned a lot and is able to teach very basic things about computers. You see, the way computers and PLCs and even a smartphone in your pocket works is with switches. Right? There's a bunch of little bitty switches inside of it that are either on or off. And when we talk about binary, we'll begin to learn that we need to deal with numbers that are either on or off, zero or one. That's all we really need. Even the YouTube video you go home and watch, or your Netflix, or whatever you watch, those are all a string of ons and offs. That's what it really is. And it's the way you interpret that string as to what it does and how it works. Okay? You can't interpret it any way you wish. Most of the ways you interpret would be garbage. Okay? There's only one good way to interpret it. That's why sometimes when you try to play a video and it doesn't work, it comes out of garbage. Well, it's not being interpreted properly. Or there's some problem with it where you can't interpret it properly. Anyway, I want to show you relays because relays are the thing he used. And of course, the relay has been replaced by the transistor, at least for many applications. Not all applications, but many applications. And of course, transistors are a whole lot faster. Relays are electromechanical devices. They are basically a coil and a switch. So a relay, they can look all sorts of different ways, but basically, electrically, here's what's going on. You close a switch, power is applied to a coil so that that coil forms an electromagnetic field, which causes some contacts to close. It causes a switch to close. Basically, a relay is a switch, usually multiple switches, and a coil. When you apply power to the coil, the switches either close or they open. In fact, I'll pass around some relays now. I've got three here. These are known as ice cube relays. The reason they're known as ice cube relays is because they kind of look like ice cubes. Okay? I'd like for you to look at these. You're welcome to take them off the base. This is a terminal block. But take them off the terminal block and you can look at it and kind of see how it works. Okay? You'll notice there are two pins on the back here that are connected to a coil in the very back. And then we've actually got four switches on this one. Pass that one around, you can look at it. Here's another one by Phoenix Contact. This is one that they're probably pretty proud of because it's probably expensive. Uh, Phoenix Contact makes really good, reliable stuff. They even got a nice little lever here to help you remove it. This is similar to that one in that it has two wires here, or two terminals, that goes to the blue coil, and then four switches in a line. Now these switches have what's called normally open and normally closed contacts. I'll explain why, what I mean by that with a much bigger relay in just a moment. And I've got another one here. Let's see, what does this one have? This one has, it's difficult to get out. This one only has two switches. It has one coil and two switches. So I'll pass this one around and let you look at it. I'll go ahead and take it apart. You guys seem to be hesitant to take them apart. So look at it and see that you can see that there are one coil, two switches. Here's the granddaddy, okay? I actually got this. We had a student who was working for the railroad. It was for, uh, at the time, I think it was called Safe Tran. Now I think it's Invensys or something like that, or Transys. I don't remember. And there may be another name altogether now. I'm holding this up for the camera, too, so those students can see. There's two really big coils back here. And when you energize these coils, let's see, where's the contact? There's two contacts down here. I don't know what this takes. We could probably read it on the label. Uh, it was by Safe Tran at the time, so they actually made this. But that portion of the company was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And let's see, DC, DC 0.057 amps. 
Uh, it doesn't tell us, but this was made in August, I guess August 18th, 1994. I don't know if it works. It looks pretty good. I assume it would work. But basically what happens is when these two coils are active, there's a bar up here that's pulled down. When that bar is pulled, there's some fingers here, it pivots, so that these move forward and changes the status of the switches. You'll notice there are three switches here. They have huge contacts on these switches. And basically you'll notice that, I wish I could toggle this, but I can't. When this bar moves forward, let's see, it will push, what will it push? Oh, it'll push these contacts so that the, well, I don't see which one's no, normally open or normally closed. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'll pass this one around too. Let's see. Um, okay, that goes there. And right now, let me see if I can see how it's making contact. Let's turn it there. So those are not making contact. Yeah, these two are. So right now, if you look at this from the, the switch side right here, you'll notice that these first two for all of the switches are connected together. Those two are called the normally closed switch. When this moves, the normally open connection is the <coughs> multimeter on these two. There's no conductivity between the common, which is in the center, and this normally open contact. But when it changes state, when we apply power to the coil, it switches, and so the, the common connects to the, the other set. So I'll pass this around also. You can look oh. Pretty hefty, huh? Um, heavier than I was expecting. Yeah. But in this relay, you can really see what's going on, and maybe the smaller relays will make more so sense. So you said with these first ones, it's when they touch, what happens? Well, what happens is when you pull this coil in, it moves this bar forward. Okay. So I think right now that these two are contacting, when you move it forward, these two are contacting. Now this is a totally separate switch, and that's not okay. a totally separate switch. So there are actually three switches on that. So we've got some relays going around. Most of them, two of them have four switches. One of them has two switches. And this big one has three switches built into it. <clears throat> now you might look at that and say, well, so what? Why wouldn't you just apply power directly? Well, what we're trying to do is control with a signal. If you, if you go over to the wall and you flip the light switch, the lights will change state, right? You can turn them on or off. Are you actually generating the electricity for driving the lights by flipping the switch? No, you're just applying a control, right? Have you ever tried to generate the electricity to turn a light bulb on? You might have been to a science museum where they have an exercise that bikes up and you can pedal in it and it turns on the lights and you see how difficult it is to actually drive lights. Well, somewhere there's a machine driving these lights. I didn't really turn on the lights, did I? All I did was make contact. Well, that's the purpose of these. You see, there are many situations where you want a very small voltage or a very small power to be able to control a larger power or switch a much larger current or a larger voltage or something. You know, just like I don't want to power the lights manually, I just want to flip a switch. I want the control. I want to be able to apply a very small force for a short period of time to the light switch and make the lights come on. Okay? So these magnetic uh, switches or relays are uh, useful because we can allow a small signal to control a much larger signal. As a matter of fact, it's, it's a pr an appropriate time, I guess, to go ahead and talk a little bit about the PLC itself. I'm going to hold it up for the sake of the camera. The ones we're using at the beginning of this class are these little click coyotes. Now, what's really the PLC is this middle part. It says click C002DD1-D. That's the PLC. To the side of it, the CO-0 or C0-01AC, that's the power supply. So the left-hand side thing is the power supply. The middle thing is actually the brain or the PLC. And the right thing that has red printing on it, if you have one, that's an extra module. Okay? Don't worry about it right now. The PLC is really the thing in the center. Now you can't plug the PLC directly into the wall. You have to have a power supply. Because the PLC needs 24 volts DC, but that wall socket gives us 24 volt, or 200, 120 volt AC. Does that make sense? So we have to have a power supply to give the PLC what it needs. But this PLC is not really designed to give power out to a machine. In other words, whenever you have a device, let's say you have a motor, whoops, you have a motor or something, and you just plug it into the wall to make it go, or a hair dryer, or a, 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 you know, an electric razor or something, right? You plug it into the wall, turn it on, it goes. Power comes from the wall. It comes from the socket. The sockets that you see here, all these things where we can connect wires, those are not 
for just giving the power out of. It's not like the PLC can just give 120 volts to something or 220 volts or 480 volts three phase, which is an industrial type of electricity. It can't put that out from this little bitty port. This is a little bitty machine. It can only provide small control signals, kind of like you can only provide a small control of flipping the light switch. Does that make sense? So what we need relays in order to basically have the PLC turn a coil on, which can switch a lot of larger contact and turn on a much bigger thing, like a big motor or something. Any of you been through 320 with me? You have. Did, you, did we go on the tour of the Cameron Road Power Generation Station? Okay. When you go on that tour with me, if you get to, when you get to 320 Thermo 2, um, I'll take you to a power plant where they're generating electricity, okay? And they've got a cooling tower. Now, this cooling tower is about the size of this building, okay? On the top of the cooling tower, they have fans. I shouldn't say fans. They're more like helicopter blades, okay? There's 10 of them. And they're driven by motors that are not motors. These are motors that are this big around, okay? And they're about as long as one of these tables huge motors to drive each individual fan. Do you think this little PLC could provide the power or switch the power to it? Of course not. The purpose of this PLC might be to control it, but it's going to switch a relay, right? What it's going to do is switch power to a coil so that a much bigger relay, like that big one that's going around, can then have a much bigger switch for actually applying power to the motor, you see? So relays used to serve two functions. One of them <coughs> was switching large amounts of current. They still serve that function. The other thing you could do with a relay, because there are multiple switches or multiple contactors in the relay, you could actually set up a set of contacts and devote it to keeping the coil on. You could bypass the switch so you could make the relay turn itself on once it was already on. Because of that, and because that's essentially a memory function, you could set up relays in a clever way and make them program basically, just like you could make a computer out of them. Now the function of making a program has largely transitioned to PLCs, but the job of switching large amounts of current is still the domain of a relay. Okay? So the function of that has been separated out. So here's how a relay works, if you haven't figured it out from looking at the ones I've passed around. Usually you've got some type of spring on the armature, you've got a movable contact and fixed contacts, and when it's de-energized, the armature is in contact with one of the fixed contacts. So if I put a wire here, I could pass current to that point. You see, I could turn on a light or something. When the coil is energized, it magnetically pulls the armature in so that now the armature contacts a different point. This point would be called the normally open point because in the de-energized state, it's open and there's no electrical connection, whereas this is the normally closed contact, you see. And this would be the common contact. So when the relay is pulled in or energized, then the common is connected to the normally open terminal. And you can use this for switching whatever you want. Okay? But that's basically how a relay works. Hopefully that makes some sense of the relays that have been passed around. So it's often the case that you have an armature that is connected or that can connect to either the normally open contacts or the normally closed. Right now the coil is not energized, it's de-energized, so the armature is connected to the normally closed contacts. You'll start to see symbols like this that sort of indicate normally closed. I don't want to make too much of a, a, a bridge in your mind between this and normally closed because this is more of a PLC instruction, but we'll get to that a little bit later. The point is we have normally closed and normally open contacts and when the, the uh, item or the relay is energized, the normally open contacts are actually closed. They're active and the normally closed contacts become open. Now here's a symbol for a uh, relay. We've got a coil that says M on it. That M is for motor starter coil. And then we've got a contact associated with it. In other words, there's an understood bridge between these two and a a magnetic bridge so that when this coil turns on, the switch changes states. Okay. CR might be what's labeled in the coil part, and that's used for a control relay. Now, a motor starter is a relay, but it's a special type of relay for actually driving a motor. That's why it's called a motor starter. Whereas a contact relay or a control relay is more often used for signals and things. So don't worry about it too much. The point is, there's many different types of relays. Okay, so 
Uh, let's see. Here's a control relay for, for controlling two pilot lights. And here we are in the state where the switches open the coil to de-energize. I'm pausing here because I haven't shown you what this is. This is actually a really clever idea, the way this is being shown. Uh, but you can, you can actually already read it as it is. You've got one leg here and another leg. Basically, power wants to go from this leg to the other side. I don't know if you guys realize this. <coughs> to give power to something, you need two wires. You ever think about that? If you need to give power to your, your laptop and your laptop has a two-pronged plug, there's two prongs, not one. right? Because actually what happens is electrons at high electric potential enter one side, deliver power to the device, and then exit, leaving at a low electric potential. Uh, one of the problems I have is I don't know whether I should teach you guys much about electricity and what it really is and how it really works. But I'll go through it very quickly, and maybe this will help you, because this is something that took me a while to figure out too. It's, it's more like potential energy, where you have some weights that are high up in the gravity field, and you let them fall doing work. That's basically what the electrons are that come out the wall. Okay? They are electrons that are at high potential energy. And you can use that potential energy to do something. So when you use power coming out of the wall, it's a lot like uh, a mill wheel. You guys ever see that, where they let water flow over a wheel and turn it and grind grain or something? Well, the water goes from high potential, or high up in the air, to low potential, and in the process turns the wheel. The water doesn't change its nature, right? All that has changed is its elevation. In the same way, electrons may go into your laptop charger, but they come back out. When they come back out, they have less energy because they're at a, letter, a lower electrical potential. It's actually a really good way to think about it. It helps clear up some of the misunderstandings mechanical guys usually have about electricity. But anyway, I want to show you more about this, and then we'll come back and look at this quickly. Have you guys ever taken apart an electronic device? So you take apart some old electronic, maybe an old radio or something that you don't use anymore, uh, or even that old microwave over there, and you find a little circuit board. If you look at the circuit board and you've had no electrical training, you probably look at it and go, hmm, well, I know this does something, but I don't really know what it does. I know it has input, probably some power, maybe it has some sensors, maybe it takes some switch input and controls things, but I don't understand how it works. It's really difficult to understand electrical circuits until you have a schematic or a way that it's laid out where it's simplified. And the key is to realize that these electrons at high potential are trying to get to low potential. They're trying to flow from high to low, just like water at high elevation. If you give it the chance, it'll flow down, right? It'll flow downhill. Well, if you lay out a schematic like this, it becomes very easy to read. Let me explain why. This is actually a schematic from a heat pump that I bought many years ago. I don't have them anymore. I ended up selling them. But inside of the, the panel, was a, a schematic to show you how the device operated. And basically the idea was you had two legs, two different wires coming from the power supply, in this case either 208 or 230 volt single phase power, and there's a difference in electric potential between the sides. So electrons want to go from here to here or vice versa. The point is they want to be connected somehow. Now obviously if you just connect these two wires you get a spark, the breaker opens up and you no longer have power. You gotta go flip the breaker back on. But if you put something useful between these two, like an electric motor, then the motor will run. Okay? And so what you notice here, this COMP, now that I've told you that it's a heat pump, any idea what COMP might stand for? The coefficient of efficiency for pumps. Uh, that's COP. It's the compressor. This is the compressor unit itself. Okay? So when this switch is closed, and this switch is closed, power flows through the compressor and operates it. It turns on it. Right? So CC stands for some contactors, basically the switches on a relay. And in fact, you'll notice that this CC switch has a corresponding CC coil down here. These two, we understand, are connected magnetically. When we apply power to this CC coil, that pulls in the contacts, so the compressor comes on, you see. Now, the way this is laid out, you can begin to understand it because you understand the compressor here has little to do with the fan, which is right here, the blower, right? It is its own little circuit that can be powered. We don't have to understand the whole circuit to understand how this works, this little piece works. And that's the nice thing about a diagram like this. In fact, these electrical diagrams are the inspiration for ladder logic, which is what we're going to program with. When you program that PLC in front of you, it's actually going to look somewhat like this. Now, you'll see a lot of switches, or you'll use a lot of switches, and you'll use a lot of output coils. You won't have a whole lot of specialty symbols <coughs> that you see strewn throughout this. Okay? 
but don't worry about all that. The point is that the, the language we're going to learn to speak looks a lot like this. And it's because when PLCs were made, uh, the, the people that designed them said, you know what, we want a programming language where electricians can understand it and do something with it. And this is a diagram or the type of diagram that electricians would be very familiar with and very comfortable with. So they wanted programming to look a lot like this. And it can actually be done fairly effectively. Now there's another item here. I'll go ahead and deplete some of this so you understand it. Not really relevant to the course, but you may be curious. This uh, uh, component here is not a switch. Notice it has a curve line on one side. You guys have all had the electrical course, 224, right? What is that? Capacitor. Capacitor, that's right. This is a capacitor. Anybody know why you might have a capacitor wired with that compressor? I, if I remember correctly, it evens out like the... You're thinking of converting AC to DC and leveling out the conversion. Yeah, I was, that's probably what I was thinking of. I couldn't remember what it was called. Well, I'll give you a quick hint about this. You probably have one at your house. In fact, when my mother was still alive, she called me up one day and said, hey, it's hot. My air conditioning is not working. Do you have any idea what it might be? I said, I don't know. I'll come over and look at it. So I went over and looked at it. Turns out you need a capacitor in order to get the compressor to even start. Her capacitor had died, basically. I was able to go down to the, the appliance store, get another capacitor, throw it in, boom, she had AC again. It was nice to be able to help my mom, you know. But you need what's called a motor start capacitor for certain types of motor, and that's all this is. It's just to help the, the motor inside that compressor start, okay? Uh, there's also a blower down here. I'm gonna skip this line because I don't remember what this is. It doesn't really matter. This is a blower motor down here. You notice that there's a, I don't know if you can read this, but there's a black wire, there's a blue wire, I think it's blue, maybe orange, I don't remember, and a red wire. No, here's the orange wire, or purple wire. What are these? Well, this is high, medium, and low. So you just wire up whichever one you want to make the blower operate at whatever speed is desired. And over here, there's a purple versus an orange. And if you look at the note, what they say is, if you have 208 volt, wire one. If you have 230, wire the other so that you get the right voltage across the motor. But you'll notice there's another contactor. There's another capacitor here for starting this motor too, but there's a contactor here that says BR on it, if I remember right, and there's a BR, where is it? Maybe it's LR. I, I don't remember right now. The point is there's a coil down here that also pulls in that switch so that the controls can control this. The let me move down. If you look at the power and the way it flows, there's a last rung here. Anybody know what this is the symbol for? Transformer. It's a transformer. That's right. We're taking power that's at, say, 230 or around 200 volts and converting it down to the voltage that the control system uses. This would be something that the thermostat would control. Do you think that thermostats have all the power for the compressor running through them? No, you'd have to have really big wires, right? Your thermostat on your wall in your home does not have large enough wires to actually provide power to the blower or to the compressor. Instead, it has small wires that can provide current to coils in relays so those coils can close switches and make the system come on. Anybody know what voltage is used for your thermostat at home? 24 volt AC. So it's actually used. Now it's nominal 24 volts. It usually varies a bit, quite a bit actually, but it's enough and it works well enough. <coughs> so what your control system does is it provides 24 volts AC at low current in order to operate the coils of relays so those relays can pull in switches to operate your air conditioner or your heat pump or whatever system you happen to have, whether it's a furnace. Okay, in a furnace you'd have to have something to pull in a coil or a coil to pull in a switch and turn on the burner, for example. Open a valve, you know, provide enough power to open a valve so gas can flow through and then make sure that it's lit so that the, the furnace can operate. So this, I wanted to show you this because it's a really nice way to lay out an electrical diagram so you can understand what's going on. That's why over here it's laid out this way. So that you can actually see the power is trying to get from here to here. And if I close this switch, it can go through that coil and operate the coil. Now what happens when this switch is closed? Well, right now the switch is open, the coil is not energized, that means these contacts are open, right? Okay, this is a relay. So this output is off. The normally closed contacts that are also associated with this relay are closed right now. And so this item, whatever it is, is on. On the other hand, when the switch closes, <coughs> excuse me, now this relay will make contact here, but break the contact here. So now this is off and this is off, okay? 
Now this is for two pilot lights, so it's just basically turning one or the other pilot light on. <coughs> Why you'd need that, I don't know. There might be a situation in the industry where you need that. Your pilot lights on your home devices these days are typically um, electric start. And what that means is that instead of being on constantly and wasting gas, they have a control system so that it can sense whether or not the pilot is lit. And when you call for heat in your furnace, the pilot's lit first. That usually generates a voltage via a sensor. Once the, the control system sees that that sensor is high for a certain amount of time,